Welcome to Out of the Blank. Welcome to another episode of Out of the Blank Podcast. Me with Bruce. Bruce, it's a pleasure to be able to speak with you on my show. You are an author of a book that has the basically the topic that's consumed my life the past couple of months. But would you please introduce yourself to everyone out there listening? Yes, my name is Bruce De Torres, and I spent the first 30 years of my life learning how to be an actor. And then I took on learning how to be a human being. I was shocked to learn they are uh, sometimes separate things. And uh, in 2004, I was convinced to look into 9-11 that the official story was a lie. I found that was true. And for 10 years, I burrowed deep into where that led. And it led to so much, including the assassination of President Kennedy and everything you are exploring with the various people you interview, Robbie. And after 10 years of looking at that, I decided to wrap that in a previous manuscript I had written about the nature of reality, the nature of consciousness, the hope that this is all an illusion and life is nothing but a spiritual game we're playing. And that's the truth that sets us free to handle like adults, the horrifying, horrifying truths of the, the realities behind the official stories. And I cobbled together this book over my shoulder, God, School, 9-11, and JFK, The Lies That Are Killing Us and the Truth That Sets Us Free. People can read all about it at my website, brucedtaurus.com, and click through and get a copy if you would. I want to praise you for the fantastic work you're doing and the massive brain power and quality of people that you have attracted to your show. It's an honor to be invited to be your guest. Well, I appreciate that. And I'm glad, you know, you were able to give me the time to be able to do this um, conversation because I'm trying to learn um, a lot of it. And it's what's interesting to me is that when you talk to a JFK researcher, they don't just focus on the JFK assassination. They focus either on the RFK assassination, MLK assassination, some even 9-11. And you start going, well, this can't be just a coincidence. Like they're not just into controversial topics. There has to be something there. And you start learning that the official story is what you're told. It's kind of like the history, like Superman, but the reality is Superman smokes cigarettes and he's a bit of a drinker. And I get it from like maybe a Patriot aspect of things, but I don't like the cover up aspect, especially if you notice that a lot of problems that are still going on today, why people are detached from having these existential crises, you know, wondering if today's times is just the worst and nobody can explain this generation or that generation. Well, it's because most of the time throughout history, we've covered up a lot of the blemishes or the things that we didn't feel like fit the history book. And that's why people are so disconnected because they're reading a superficial story, one that's clear cut and sold to the public. And then the reality of it is there's some warts there. Indeed, quite by design in terms of the mass control of our society and uh, pounding my chest. This is well laid out in broad strokes in my book. It's only 175 pages with about 45 pages of sources. So people can test it for themselves. Huh? Is this true? Are Bruce's conclusions logical and reasonable? Uh, it brings to mind Lincoln's quote from 1858. If we could first know where we are and whither we are tending, we could better know what to do and how to do it. I used to get up at an open mic every Wednesday for years down in Atlanta. And I would say things like, we're tied to the tracks and a train is coming. We need to spread the word and tell people that so that more of us can chew the ropes and have a chance of, at this stage, it's recreating America because we don't live under the constitution anymore. And if that's not a big deal, I don't know what is. To your point, it's a Superman fantasy to say, we're America, we're Americans. It's a lie, we're not. We don't live under the constitution since the imposition of the USA Patriot Act and the Department of Homeland Security at the least, and everything since then that has violated our rights under the constitution. 
if our rights are being violated for specious reasons like a permanent state of war and an extended war and other wars and add some wars and add some emergencies that just so-called so supposedly justify not honoring our rights, we don't live under the Constitution and we're not America. The house is on fire. And then if you really see where things are trending and tracking, as your guests are teaching your audience, it's urgent to spread the word. So, you know, the bottom line is anybody listening to this, do something. Anybody filling themselves with this knowledge, do something. If you've never done anything before, the first thing you do, you might, it might be overwhelmingly scary just to bring up in conversation with people you've never heard anyone say anything like, hey, do you know anyone who thinks or believes that 9-11 was an inside job or the government whacked President Kennedy? And then just step back and just see what you cause. Throw a pebble in the pond. We need rocks and boulders and everything thrown into the pond to stir up more people concerned about holding our representatives' feet to the fire so that they might work for us, so we could eradicate those who are corrupted. And uh, that's, the grand, that's the point of writing a book like mine or having a show like yours, I think, right? I would say that I think people should think more critically about stuff. Like when weird things start to happen, you should at least be able to question. But the idea of rolling your eyes and just walking away because it's labeled as the same thing as like UFO talk. I'm like, that doesn't the conversation should still boil down to something. And I'm sure, you know, with the JFK community, it's pretty divided on a lot of things. And it's very, very it's elitism in a lot of the research, not amongst I mean, amongst some on the conspiracy side and amongst some on the lone nutter side. And it's like, well, how do you just want people to learn the real history of things, whether you b agree with the official story? I mean, there's documentation to back up a lot of things were wrong that day in 63. But then I mean, I the 9-11 was a topic I hit way before the JFK one. I did a because I and eventually hit episode 911. So I figured the best thing to do would be to have a six hour episode with four different guests learning people's experience of 9-11, but also to talking about the weird thing. Why was the scrap sold immediately, basically after the incident happened? Why was that sold to China? Why was there that other guy who wrote uh, was on my show, Ray McGinnis, who's writing a book for the second investigation the family wants? I mean, 118, I think, explosions they talked about. Uh, it sounds like self-detonating explosions that these paramedics and people were hearing. I mean, there's a lot of stuff where it's like, all these people can't just be going through shell shock or conspiracy, and they all can't be of that mindset. And people bring up the example, well, it's because they don't want the official story to be true. I'm like, I, I feel like knowing that and knowing that's the official thing would help them get some rest, help them, you know, their minds at ease a little bit. But the fact that there is things you can question and there are things that are unexplainable and weird connections that line up. That's what we need to figure out. And that's what we need to know. And the fact of covering it up what for national security is not a good answer. Right. And basically, you're describing folks who haven't researched a thing for themselves. And we can get that, you know, America is a tough place to make a living anymore. And it's unfortunately too easy to just be glued to the phone all day, get the headline feeds from the mainstream media and think that that's the truth and you just blithe you just go on and no, you and you can dismiss i don't have the you know oh it's it's really the opposite of that bruce i don't have the time to you know but that's not an excuse not to try like you are with your show and i am with with uh, what i'm doing you know i help my publisher with a with a shameless plug trynday.com look around for the books and look around for the podcast there oh my god that's it. That's all I'll say to anyone who wants to get up to speed about these things. The bickering or the different ways of looking at things in the JFK community. Great. Don't believe one researcher. Don't believe one book. Please, ladies and gentlemen, don't believe one newspaper article about anything. You have to read two or three or four or five or 5,000 like I have. Maybe I'm exaggerating. I don't even know anymore to get a feel of because Every human being is a prism. You know, you and I can, it, it, this happens on juries all the time. 12 people see and hear the exact same testimony and evidence and they go into the deliberation room. That's not what he said. No, that is what he said. So you have to get, that's why it takes a village to 
quote, whatever. It takes comparison. You know, you know, a friend says truth is a collaboration. We all bring something to the table. So it's and as you described, everything about everything in quotes about the 9-11 official story falls apart when you examine it. That's what the great author Jim Mars said about the Kennedy assassination, JFK. Every place you look at the official story, it's not supported the way we're told it is. And in fact, it completely falls apart. And I love to think of myself as a member of the jury. You got to look at all the evidence and think for yourself, does it make sense to you? Does it make sense to you? And that's a, that's a huge challenge right there, Robbie, getting Americans to trust their own judgment because 90% of Americans go through public school. And I make the case in my book that school trains us to do one thing, obey, shut up and do what you, what you're told. So we graduate as young adults and have panic attacks because for the first time, in the last couple of generations, 18, 19, 20 years old are melting down and freaking out because for the first time in their lives, they have to make decisions. And without an experience of making decisions that matter, not what TV show to watch or what video game to play, decisions that matter, your heart's going to pound like a tiger's chasing you and you get, you, you're unprepared for life and you want what you were raised to have during your formative years in school. Somebody to tell you what to do, a boss. And if you get really good at following orders like that, you can rise through hierarchies, corporate hierarchies, at pharmaceutical companies, military hierarchies, or right back in the education system, and now you're a teacher, and there's no thinking for yourself. And I don't know where you broadcast this. Can we talk about the recent disease and its supposed cure safely, or might you get deplatformed? Yeah, YouTube would just flag that immediately. I mean, I, I post this everywhere, but I, I don't want to strictly stick it to Spotify. I feel like you'd get more content viewership for your book as well, too, on YouTube. You can call it magic juice if you want, but that, even that's a that's a slim chance. And look, I've talked to both sides, people that represent people that were injured and people that fight the other side saying there's pro mandates. I've had people from the NIH in my show, WHO, Peter McCullough, Dr. Pierre Corey. I've had all these both sides on my show. So I'm very, very, you know, looking at it a weird thing, but I always bring up the example and people can say I'm nuts, but you know, you get, you let the government make a medical choice for you, mandate something, whatever. It's not weird that after 50 years of this thing being figured out with Roe versus Wade, that randomly just pops right back up. It's goalpost moving. You see it happen in everything that they do. Oh, you know, we're just going to do a temporary thing for two weeks. Well, that lasted a lot longer than two weeks. And next thing you know, you couldn't leave your house. And I was getting five. There was five thousand dollar fines in my town. COVID topic aside, you just start noticing when you start being able to question, you realize that there's a lot of people questioning. There's things that don't add up. You know, you could talk about protests. Why is it OK to protest if it's a racial matter, but you're not able to go to a church because of COVID? I mean, that is weird in its own. And you start realizing the people that are making these decisions they never told you to lose weight during this whole entire pandemic. And I think it was like 32 months or something like that. Someone finally addressed maybe going outside and getting some exercise and they didn't want to because it was fat shaming or the way that society was going. And the real key takeaway is that the people are very strong, but you have to get everyone to start talking and start asking these questions and bouncing off these thoughts that we all have individually, where we're all thinking something in our head because my thoughts are going to be different from your thoughts we might agree on some things we might disagree but that leads to conversation and what happens in that conversation you learn the other person's perspective and then now you're both knowledgeable and i think that's very very important but we don't do that as people nobody questions 9 11 whenever you bring it up they go it's a conspiracy theory i was like do you think it's weird that that's a, that was a closed door testimony that there were no cameras in that and then we see other decisions that get made in our judicial system and it's broadcasted live on television like Epstein was another one of those scenarios. Oh, controversial figures involved. Really? Come on now. I'm not that dumb. But people go, oh, that's conspiracy talk. I'm like, all right, great. Call me a conspiracy theorist. I'm in. Yeah. Yeah. And laying a big, you know, landscape as we are with the things we're saying here, Robbie, the contradictions of logic, 
serves the purpose of those who want to weaken, shrink, and control us. Look at the, the, I think it's the majority of Americans now don't vote. Uh, I don't. Which which means that we don't bother to figure it out. We're we're numb to wear, wear a thing Monday. Now you don't have to wear a thing on Tuesday. So we, we know we're, we're just, we're, we're, we're numb to the abuse. There's no way to figure it out. You just give up. They've done this with dogs and now they've done it with America for the last hundred years, I believe with the propaganda and the mind control and the psychological abuse and the trauma-based mind control. If you send conflicting signals to a dog, you know, if I do this, do I get rewarded? If I do this, do I get beaten? If you conflict, if you mess up those signals, so the dog doesn't, the dog just gives up, it won't eat or drink. That's it. So there's the, the great apathy serves those who want to do whatever they want without regard to we the people while we pretend to still have a democratic republic with representatives who are responsive to us. And the solution really is uh, spreading the word. When it comes to 9 11, my go to question like yours was, you know, oh, the closed doors testimony. And maybe you don't do that every time, but here's another one I like to do. How many times has a building fire caused the building to quote unquote collapse before 9-11 or since 9-11? Doesn't happen. And you just tell folks, you just walk in. Like I've stunned people, strangers in conversation, making small talk. Think about it. Those buildings came down at free fall speed. That means something was taking all the resistance, all the mass on the way down. Out of the way. They like, said it was the jet fuel. Wait, like explosives? Like it kind of proves explosives were taking that away. And and the answer to the jet fuel is it doesn't get hot enough. You know, it goes on and on and on. There's a great chapter in my book about 9-11, but that's just to get people's wheels turning. And then, like I said, they can see the contradictions and not care. How do you get people to care? You know, that's that's a huge psychological thing. And and uh, a point I make is to parent ourselves and each other, to mom and dad ourselves and each other. Pretend that you're a loving, caring, wonderful mom and a wonderful dad. And that's how you talk to yourself and talk to others. Moms love and calm and restore. (laughs) Kids get upset. (laughs) Every little thing, right? I I dropped my toy. (laughs) Mom's job and Bruce's opinion is they're there. Everything's all right. Here it is to restore and heal and make okay sanctuary safety 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 love and comfort we have to talk to, i say we have to talk to ourselves like that and others who are yeah but yeah but yeah but all excitable and then we we get to dad ourselves which is to empower and encourage come on we got a lot of work to do we have a lot of things to build. We have a lot of people to see. We have a lot of things to learn. We have a lot of messes to make, a lot of things to clean up, and then come back, wash up, tell everybody what we did and saw and learned, and ask them what they did and saw and learned. And we're all going to learn all every, all night long. And then we're going to go to bed and we're going to dream about doing it all again tomorrow. Come on. Mom is love. Dad is empower and encourage. And that's how if more people did that, there'd be more happiness, there'd be more collaboration, there'd be more curiosity. But how else do we instill in people the truth matters and you matter? The truth only matters if you have a sense that you can do something with it and for it. John F. Kennedy, President Kennedy said, every man can make a difference and every man should try. You and I are the type that just naturally, boom, this is our reaction to the lies and the harms and the crimes and the outrages that we've seen. It's just natural. We can't, we can't help it. It's an obsession. William Law, who you know, you believe eloquent, among all the other researchers, also has said the JFK assassination is this trap. It's just, maybe I'm paraphrasing somebody else, it's, it just sucks you in. Well, we just naturally uh, are outraged like that. But it takes more than just those who are naturally outraged for the truth. And that's where we have to lead people into safety and make it okay. Because most people only do what they see others do. So that's why it really matters that each and every individual speaks up about the truth because it will 
inspire those who would, if they just see somebody else do it first, they can do it first. They can do it also. Do you not blame our system though? I blame a lot like our legal system. And I know people always talk about, yeah, there's wrongfully imprisoned. I'm not just talking about that. We have it set up like a game where if you're a defendant, if you're a prosecutor, if you're a defendant, if you're a lawyer on whoever side, your goal is to win. Basically, that's how they set it up. You're going to get paid if you win. You know, it, you're going to get some type of compensation. You're going to get a good remark on your record. And it starts to become if you're a lawyer defending somebody, are you going to look at the facts of the actual case or you're only going to look at the facts that best fit the narrative where you're trying to support the person you are defending? The prosecutor as well, too. You're not going to look at the stuff against you. You're only going to look at the stuff for it. You might look at it to counter it, but it's just how our society set up. Even the, the debates are a joke. You got two people bickering back and forth and trying to get their best opinions, literally just a popularity contest to see who's going to get voted in to run this country. I mean, I, I one person running the country is a difficult decision. That's got to be enough stress on anybody. But you no, know, whenever you ask someone, who did you vote for? They always either say the left or the right, but nobody ever says, what about the independent? And the answer I usually get to that is they'll never win. Well, if we live in a simulation, why don't you test it and try it out? I don't vote because I don't believe that the president actually has power. I think they can make facial decisions, like maybe raise price of gas or something like that, or maybe change something or pass a bill if they're accepted to do so. But you're looking at the Supreme Court. Let's look at the Supreme Court, for instance. How long are those people usually on the bench? A very long time, more than four years. And you're telling me the guy who's just getting into the system for four years, and maybe if he gets elected, maybe again, eight. You're telling me he has more power than the other people that have been knowing how to work the system for over 20 years, over 30 years, and know how everything runs, know what games they got to play, know what bills they got to sign, know what money they got to transfer over so they get money in their pocket. Whenever you say that, people go, oh, that's like deep state talk, and they'll roll their eyes. I get it, but the idea of rolling your eyes at something like that or shunning the conversation, I mean, do you really think when they make a disinformation board and they say we're going to help relate online content we're gonna help skew it in to save you and your child do you think they really care when they're showing tit ads and they're showing boner pills to your seven-year-old kid who's playing on a tablet on minecraft they don't they just care about money and they want to make sure that nobody is trying to expose a lot of that and sadly i think at this point in reality people have just accepted it and they're happy they don't care they don't care my generation doesn't care my generation doesn't care about history because nobody has been willing to talk to them it's all been talking down or making it so damn aggressive where you can't and that's not how you get people hooked into stuff you got when people ask questions they might see dumb like my jfk first episode i look like an idiot probably still do now but i know a lot more and i'm learning and it's that whole thing where you might cringe you might think it's a dumb question but it's important to that person who's asking that question we don't do that we haven't taught people in this world to really think anymore and i know there's academics and stuff out there but i mean everything is just peter bogosian's a good example he made the misconceptual penis project which was a fake paper talking about how the the men who spread their legs open is akin to raping the air around them and a school published that they said it was a good study they didn't read it they looked at sexual gender they looked at all this type of stuff and this was exposed by brett weinstein peter bogosian michael Shermer, who i've had on my show and you just get into this aspect of like It's our institutions too. Our institutions must be the problem. Oh, it's everywhere. It's every single thing. If you don't like it, you don't say anything about it. You just get pissed off and ignore that, whatever that problem is and think it'll go away. It doesn't. It doesn't. And I'm not a conservative. I'm not a Republican. I'm not a Democrat. I don't like them all. Um, I I don't mind the people in them, like the individuals. I haven't met them. Like, it doesn't matter. But I don't believe that you're going to look for corruption in your own side if you side with something if you choose your republican you choose your democrat you're going to look for it on the other side and not choose it in your own and i think that's a terrible start that that is and you well described how hopeless it really can seem can seem it's you're absolutely right it's a 360 degree long-term plan that has brought us here with uh, documented evidence of why they're doing it and where they would like to take us and it's no place good so what do we do? We slog on anyway, you know, and history is one of the single greatest empowerments to anybody who is trying to, you know, get, you know, get started with, with how, how to be, how to stay calm, how to be happy, how to live a life, how to find a way to earn a living, 
let alone impact and stop the horrors that these that these horrible forces are taking us to. You know, I submit into your very, very educated depiction about how effed we are that, and I'm going to probably start repeating myself, you know, it's one step at a time. And it's also to clarify as an individual, what do I want? Given the realities you just listed, and they are realities. What do I want? I don't want to, I don't want to live in an America like that. I don't want to live in a society like that. Okay, what do you want, Bruce? I want to live where people are kind, where people feel safe, where people collaborate, respect each other, and and work well together. Okay, I can create one person like that, me, and I can endeavor to remember those fine goals with each and every conversation, starting with you right now. And then starting with everyone I talk to, moment by moment. And that is a power of mindfulness and paying attention and awareness that thoughtful people get to as well. The power of our intention and being where we are right now. Because the tyrants who would oppress us, Robbie, as you know, they want to fill us with fear. They want to brainwash us. They want us to think about what they want us to think about and worry about what they want us to worry about. And we have to wake up and, and recognize, how do I feel? And the average American is freaking out. Just look at the amount of antidepressants and other drugs and alcohol and entertainment and addictions and suicide. People are trying to escape reality because they're, they are filled with the fire hose of upsetting information. So the first victory is over one's own mind and emotions. How do I feel? How long have I felt this way? Try to figure that out. And listen, when someone tells you yet again, turn the TV off, turn the mainstream off, give yourself two, three, four, five weeks and just see the difference it makes. At first, you might go crazy with the noise in, in your head, but if you could grit your teeth, hang on, and avoid the drugs and alcohol and get outside in nature, you might calm down and you might have the fantasy, everything's okay. I could give, I could go on and on with this sermon, Ravi. I've been reading and writing about this stuff for decades, well, man. You said someone got you into 9-11. I'm curious to, was that the official starting point when you started thinking like this? Like I got lucky. I did a spinoff show of this show after like 50 episodes and you can probably still find this stuff up there. It's on my channel. I think it was called fill in the blank. And what it was is I asked my friends who were on the original show when I was doing them in person, the first hundred were in person. Um, so I'd have random strangers come to my house, which was always fun. Uh, but I would ask them, what's a good topic you really like? And they would say some person would be like, I'd like to learn about ocean exploration. I'd learn like to learn about this. And I like all things. So I eventually just started printing out Wikipedia pages and other links. I talked about People's Temple. I learned about Operation Midnight Climax. I learned about MK Ultra. I learned about the Tuskegee experiments. I learned about the Edgewood experiments. I learned about so much dark history. And there was an 800 page thing I had on JFK that nobody ever wanted to fully do in an episode, but I got to it a thousand episodes later. Um, but it, it was something where I was like, oh my God, you really start looking at what is just, they're, they're saying it, they're giving you what the real history is, but we don't care to look for it. We don't know to look for it. We're not guided to this. We're guided a different message and it's the overall content that's absorbed to us every single day. So I'm curious to how you got down this path where you started questioning more and you started getting to where we're at now. I, I was always a voracious reader my whole life. Uh, his, American history, general history, uh, show business. I was an actor all around, in and around show business, reading. I just love to read. I just, uh, that's how I just love to read, 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 read. And when I was around 40 years old, I had already read and knew that JFK was nonsense. And I knew a lot of things were nonsense, but I was living my life. And in 2004, at a business conference, one of the speakers on stage was was talking about current events and made the claim that, you know, the 9-11 the official story is, is nonsense. That's the first I'd ever heard of that, 2004 in the summer. 
So I approached him after he, he came off stage. And the next day we went out to, to lunch and I just picked his brain. And then uh, when I got back home, I, I started looking into it and quickly found. And a lot was a lot more findable back in 2004 on the Internet and YouTube. It was like the Wild West and anybody could publish anything. And you could find very easily uh, alternative and independent. And I found the movie Loose Change. I found the book, uh, what David Ray Griffin had already put out there and quickly saw holy smokes. And like I said, I just kept reading, reading into all the trails that that, you know, you go back and you see the players. For instance, you get to 9-11. Okay, one tangent you can follow after 9-11 is George W. Bush and the Bush family. And that goes right to the CIA and Skull and Bones. I know the Seven says, or not Skull and Bones Society with Geronimo's head. And nobody talks about that where George Bush's dad stole Geronimo's skull. They say allegedly, but the family was suing. So it was like, hang on a second. They're being compensated either to make the scandal go away or it's true. Well, yes. And that fellow, Prescott Bush, who was the father of you know, George Herbert Walker Bush, the first president, the grandfather of George W. Bush, was also a member of Skull and Bones. Those were all Skull and Bones members, okay, which is a secret society, if your audience doesn't know, at Yale University. There are many secret societies at the various universities around the country, up in that Ivy League kind of world generally. And, and it's a weird coincidence that all those universities, they're all also able to have CIA and FBI agents involved in it as well, too, which I learned recently. Yeah, the, the, and particularly, I think Skull and Bones is a, is a breeding ground for many that got recruited into the CIA, including George Herbert Walker Bush. But that Prescott Bush, the grandfather and the father, was a banking partner with uh, Avril Harriman, with the Harriman family. Of Brown Brothers Harriman, and they are an investment banking firm that goes back to the beginning of the 19, uh, 1900s. And they were involved with others on Wall Street with funding and creating the Bolsheviks and the communists in the Soviet Union and the Nazi Party in Germany. And those bankers were also involved, those kind of bankers, their circles were involved with the creation of the Federal Reserve in 1913 and the supposed. And I say supposed federal income tax, because that's a huge murky arena right there of, hey, how unconstitutional is that? How much of a ripoff scam has that been since 1916 when it supposedly was ratified? And within a few years, the Supreme Court had ruled that the amendment or the law that created the federal income tax gave Congress no new taxing authority. So that's a whole possible, and many are convinced, scam, because in their wisdom, the founders created a constitution that severely controlled the power to tax because they knew, maybe not in their words, to tax is the power to control and destroy. And there you go, Ravi, you know, like just any one thing leads to and here, you know, the the intentional planned control and destruction of America and our rights. What a, and you get to appreciate, there's a chapter in my book called The Brief History of the United States to show people that through, throughout history, going back as far as we have records, might makes right, just like in the jungle and among bullies on the schoolyard, might makes right. Why do I take your lunch money if I'm bigger and stronger than you? Because I can. And that's what gangs and warlords and then kings and queens always did and always want to do because there are some sick psychos who love power over others. And I think it's because they subconsciously hate themselves but they can't acknowledge that that's subconscious. So they're not aware of their self-hatred. So they have to project and hate somebody else and make a victim out of somebody and torture them the way they would love to torture and die themselves because they hate themselves. To make this point, the founding of the United States of America 
is this rare and beautiful thing that says rights make might. And I say it's the high point of human history. And since the day we were founded, there are the economic and brutal tyrannical forces that have been trying to subvert and water down and destroy that concept of freedom. And it seems like they it was let to balloon for a while because to commoditize and control and exploit and make money with the raw natural resources of this continent, millions and millions of people had to be encouraged to work, work, work with the promise of getting ahead. So all those, those freedoms kind of allowed those to happen. But in about 100 years, by the late 1800s, millionaires had been created who like, okay, and the technology, okay, now we can really start compacting and consolidating and monopolizing and streamlining. And by then, members of Skull and Bones graduates had risen into great positions of power throughout many governments and throughout the biggest corporations and the biggest banks. And ever since then, till today, they have colluded to constrain those freedoms, control us as employees and consumers. And now they don't even need us as consumers anymore with technology and AI and robotics. And they don't need us as employees anymore with AI and technology and robotics. So I see them sickening, harming, killing, controlling, and effing with our heads for the long range goal that seems to be documented. I've seen, I've seen the research to reduce the population and to contain us and control us in these mega cities so that the world can be their luxurious playground, these elite psychopaths, the richest of the rich. And you look at the transhuman agenda and the merging of, you know, humanity with technology. <laughs> That's some of the top ones on my show. Hey, man. Right. So this this is we, we live in a thrilling, exciting, horrible, horrible sci fi sicko James Bond with horrible villains. We live in it. But if you leave the TV news and read The New York Times, you're going to think that. Oh, the Democrats are trying to help us or the Republicans are trying to help us and they just don't get along. No, it's not. Yeah. I'm going to give you an example of something. You tell me if you think this is similar. For so long before the pandemic, they had casted out the idea that you can be your own. You can start your own business. You can make so much money. You can be successful doing. You don't have to have a boss. You can do whatever you want. Then the pandemic happened and people had the opportunity to become their own entrepreneur. And after a month or two months, what happened? They lost money. They gave up on it and they realized it wasn't for them. You just walk them to the sales pitch. The sales pitch was you can do this anytime you want. You don't have to complain about your job anymore. You can start your own business. But the game is so monopolized to where when you do take your shot, you blame all the failures on yourself and not on the issue that we're living in an industry that's not going to allow new breeders to be out there. And I mean, that's how our system works. Competition gets bought up all the time. We say, well, that's the corporate world. I mean, we learn that when we try and a new company tries to go to China, thinking that they can get one over on the Chinese people because they believe that, oh, since I speak English and they don't know English that well, I'm probably smarter than them. Not true. They end up owning that person's company and that person ends up being on the side of the street with nothing. It was a big issue our government was talking about for a while. We had to stop people from going over there, new business people, without at least a confidant or someone in the government to be able to talk to this person, be able to help them out because they were getting the wool pulled over their eyes. And it's just the corporate world. It's business. We've let it's not strange when it comes to the point of the wealthiest, whatever percent stayed and were OK when all the rest suffered. And the sales pitch is always we're all equal and we're always this type of thing. And I think most of the public believes that there's this issue with the wealth elite, but they also believe like it boils down to, no, it's only independent races. I'm like, it's all of us. I've been a minority my whole life in any situation, school, work, any of this type of stuff, even the healthcare industry. But I sued state of Maryland and John Hopkins and I won both times. That's like unheard of because those are huge huge like mega complexes 
but it's because I slipped through the system because I didn't care about doing all this, keeping up with whatever they want you to do. You need to fill out this form constantly every single month. You need to have a doctor's appointment. I stay off the radar when it comes to a lot of that stuff. And you start realizing, oh, it's slipping through the system. It might be more a race issue as well, too. But it is just the factor of if you don't play our game, we're going to forget about you. And when you do need help, it's going to take you a long process to get there. When I was explained on the phone trying to get a medication I needed for six months or seven months after I jumped through all their hoops, they go, oh, well, you did everything right. But sorry, it took you so long to get this. I was like, I've been on the phone trying to call you guys for months and just nothing but voicemail or being redirected. And they go, we got to understand, we get a stack of papers on our desk and they kind of just read the top, stamp it, no or yes. And then it gets passed on. And I'm like, you know how many people like need something where they're dying and they need this medication? You're going to stamp yes or no. And it was like, usually it'll say urgent on the top of it. I'm like, what am I hearing right now? What is happening? And it's like, yeah, you start losing your faith and just a lot of things that you think are going to be there. I know everyone talks about our healthcare systems, not the best. And it's like, well, it's like this everywhere. You know, if you don't, if you aren't connected, you're not getting a seat to the table. The game is set up right now to where the people who are super connected are going to be successful. The people that pitch what the super connected people are pitching are going to be successful. Independent news is always been around but it's relatively had this new platform to be able to do so and even then i don't know how long that's going to last you've just set the table with with tons of uh, insight and experience and uh urgent matters um first of all entrepreneurship this is why history is important to push onto people because when we see how Americans, for example, functioned under freedom for our first 100 years of existence, one could get very inspired or outraged because we're living so far below par. We are so screwed the way you just described with your example of there are these giant companies that provide things and we're at their mercy. Um, and so to, to see a scenario from the 1800s of Regular people being able to study, learn, try everything they want until they kind of find, found their niche is thrilling. Um, it's, it's because it shows this is what a free human is, is capable of, or that's what humans did when they were free. Not everybody was free, obviously, in the 1800s, but those who were uh, inspire those who aren't. Like, I want freedom because look, look. Look how robust, look how exciting, look how much they've accomplished by the time they're 15 years old. Literally, there were, there were a few officers in the Civil War on both sides of the battle who were 12 and 14 years old. Why? Because, well, they were the most competent. When you're not trapped in school, we rise to competence at different rates. That's one of the other reasons, that's another reason school sucks. It's inhuman. It's a crime against humanity. And in the late 1800s, the, the, the Supreme Court started, or the, all the courts, or the Supreme Court started ruling because of the uh, argument of a member of Skull and Bones, who was, I believe, a member of the Supreme Court, to honor the rights of corporations as if they were human beings. Well, that stinks. And because they've now got separations of liability and things like that, they can, they have done, you could extrapolate all the crappy service you just described is because case after case after case has allowed uh, that kind of momentum and the corruption of the judges and the lawyers with from money with the owners of the banks and corporations to rule in their favor. And again, it comes down to, and it, it's not the only answer, Robbie, but for you and I and for Americans, it's a great start to grab the Constitution and the Bill of Rights as the first tool to use, the first handle, the first foundation to stand on and to start to work with and look at what was written then and look what, what, what was said in the first 50 years as rulings came down about like, no, this protects the people. No, the company can do this, this, and the other thing. And you see this really robust debate about, no, look what the states can do and what the Federal government can't touch. Ah, because of the way it was intended and the way that it was set up. Was it perfect? No. Can anything humans make be perfect? 
No. Can anything humans make cover every possible case that might emerge? No. That's why it takes as many Americans and human beings as possible to be as educated as possible, to be as experienced as possible so they can trust their own judgment and participatory and participate in the things of their own life, the laws that regulate your own business, you know, to be able to robustly pull and tug and, and, and you know, participate in the outcomes that affect a person. It sounds like fantasy land. It sounds like utopia now compared to how horrible things are right now. I, your description of trying to get help on a customer service line is one is typical of the worst of the horrible conditions that we live in right now. The that customer was, service is John, amazing. It's amazingly horrible. That was John Hopkins medical line. <clears throat> Think about that. Quote unquote. Well, right. So it's propaganda. It's an old belief. It's nonsense. It's Superman to think like these are the highest quality institutions. Your story shows how they really treat people. And that's it comes, it seems to come down. I'm again, I feel like I'm repeating myself, not because of anything you've led us to, but just, um, uh, you know, the, the, that as hopeless as it seems, what are we going to do about it? What do we want? And to just keep leaning into that, you know, um, I saw a thing recently that says we're all climbing a mountain. Some of us laugh and sing and admire the view. Some of us hate and complain every st step. It doesn't matter. We all have to climb the mountain, you know, and to, to do it with uh, as much understanding and forgiveness, because the way you describe your frustration and it's completely understandable, you could see the burning in the heart and you could see why some people either check out or go postal, you know, and uh, I encourage folks as a great solution. And this is worth throwing in even though it hasn't really been touched in this conversation, to develop a spiritual imagination. Because I think that is a huge part of reality, a reality that we have to acknowledge and can leverage to our advantage. Spend some time in nature and reflect on everything that ever happened to you. and Look for the coincidences. Look for the surprises. Look for the things like, you know, that was really miraculous the way that that showed up just in time to pull my chestnuts out of the fire, you know? And work hard, give it a try, you know, weeks or months, you know, is there a spiritual presence? Does love conquer everything? This, that, and the other thing, because I'm here to tell you countless, very, very smart people through the ages have written poems and told stories and reflections and meditations to reveal that to us, that our thoughts do become things that we do have a collaborator that rewards our confidence and our kindness. So I, I, I should put that on the table as a great empowerment that the evil oppressors don't want us to recognize, talk about, or rely on. How do we take the stigma out of saying that? There's a, there's a, whenever this type of conversation happens, you know, there's people right now listening, like, oh my God, they think it's all, these all people are nuts, whatever they're talking about. But I'm like, but if you just lay it out like strategically, like leave all the like I try and leave all the politics out the door and people say, well, you got to worry about politics. I had a conversation with a transhumanist who told me you don't care about abortion rights. You don't care about this. I'm like, how does that link into transhumanism? I'm like, that's because it's all the right that's doing it and taking all these away. I'm like, no, it's it's going to be both sides. You got to understand the way that things go. It's not right or left. And when you use those labels, whoever sides with that political party is going to tune out. And now the conversation is going to be limited to whichever side isn't being involved in that stigmatized word or, or any of that sense. So let's boil it down to smart, logical factors. There are things you can question in this world. I mean, let's take it to a JFK thing. Marina Oswald stating when she changed her opinion in like 94, 97, when she said, I didn't know the government or the American government was like mine or was like, was like this, but she's talking about her home country of Russia where they do do these types of things. Now let's expand upon that. How is it simple for us as people to realize that there's a dictator in another country and we say, oh, that person needs to be taken out. We can justify killing Castro. People can accept that, or maybe because he's mad and insane or what he's doing to his people. It's still a human being, no matter if he's good or bad. You believe he deserves death? You believe that, really? That's a, that's a, that's a logical thing in your mind? Examine anywhere else. Putin, examine any other country, China, where people go, well, thank God we don't live over there. We do. We do. It might not be as open as over there. 
they do it here behind your back. At any point, you can lose everything and they don't care. They've done, they've locked people away. They'll do anything like that. And that can happen and it happens everywhere. And people are more happy to say, oh, that will never happen here. That's not like over here. They have different strategies of doing so. People get what they want and they will in the end if you let them. And it's not talking about rising up against your government. It's just questioning more things. I mean, I'll take it again to a more modern example, but Epstein, dude suicides himself. And I know people are rolling their eyes right now like, oh, God, he's talking about Epstein. The man was able to leave jail six days out of the week on work release and be gone for most of the day. He only had to be in jail basically to sleep. He was only there on Sunday the whole day. Basically, he couldn't leave. He was in an isolated part of the prison. They said the cameras didn't work. You're telling me a man killed himself when he had that much freedom where he could literally do what anything he want. He had TV. He can do whatever the hell he wanted. I, I, I really raise that up there as like a, if you can't question that. And I know a lot of people just they get on with their day. And that's because so much information is shoved at you. So much stuff is told you you need to care about this or there's this tragic event that goes on. Man, people are just fed up. They're done. They're depressed. They're medicated. I think recently was... um when they finally did an advertisement for the, or a, a news story on the amount of uh, pharmaceuticals. I mentioned that a couple of times from 2020 to 2021 there are no 2019 to 2021. There were over 900,000 deaths of opioid overdose from the ages of 19 to 49. My uncle being one of those deaths and you didn't get a single story reported on it. Nobody even mentioned anything, but you get a Pfizer ad every single time. And I'm not attacking Pfizer here. I'm just looking at the most recent case I've seen of the news talk about it was saying Walmart is going to be sued and other pharmaceutical companies. They're pushing the blame again. They did it in the beginning. The CDC pushed the blame on people's governors saying lockdowns. It can't be worse than the actual cause or effect of the disease. That was the CDC who said that in the beginning. You need to make everybody on lockdown. You need to make everybody stay home. Then they push it on your governors when it, people started having domestic violence go up, suicides, all these types of things start to happen. We let the people that are supposed to be held responsible and will blame the president or will blame some figure, whoever, a governor will blame that. Blame the real things that are constantly there, no matter if it's a different term or it's a different election, the system that's set in place. If you don't question the system and people can say the system sucks and have their examples to do so, but I don't know, these types of talks, it's like, how do you get the stigma out of the things we say? Because anybody can just roll their eyes and be like, oh, I don't want to be on a conspiracy. I'm not a conspiracy show, but there's reasonable arguments to be had on a lot of these things and nobody wants to have the discussion about it and i think that's so stupid yeah and you know you're searching you're, you know you're searching for what other people know in order to build your own knowledge base and to try to you know see what what's probably true i that's a that's probably how wisdom develops you know it's what's probably true if you didn't experience if we or didn't experience tumor. ourselves huh i said or a tumor well you're developing something so <laughs> i just i say it's not a tumor <laughs> um it's you know it takes lots of these conversations and especially i i i repeat you know we've got to remember we for the most part you and i are talking to and about americans and 90 percent of americans have gone through public school and taking the bell curve as a model, you know, like in a statistical graph of how do, how do people perform? Most people perform kind of in the middle of excellence. And here there's kind of like, you know, low excellence. And then, you know, most people perform like moderately well here. And then down here are the, are the real experts who zoom ahead. So that's the bell curve model of, of performance. And I submit at my old age that most people love to and automatically do what everybody else does, you know? So, and school trains us to survive in cutthroat competition in, in a hierarchy, okay? For employment in a hierarchy. And they want us to think, I'm better than you, I'm worse than you, so that I can abuse you and take abuse from the people above me so I can rise in the hierarchy, right? You think of rising the corporate ladder or rising through, through the military, okay? 
And at this end of the curve are the people who absolutely reject it. They'll either do drugs, kill themselves, tattoo themselves up and just change their hair color and just, you know, be, even become homeless in order to not compete in that insane anti-human way, because that's got nothing to do with living in nature. It's got nothing to do with being raised by a, an extended family or village that loves you, that respects you and wants you to be a full functioning adult who can do things on your own, right? That hierarchy is inhuman. It's for robots, slaves, and soldiers. That's what a hierarchy is for. It's inhuman. So there are those who absolutely reject it. The vast majority take to it like that and just muddle through it. Everybody's going to school. I'm going to go to school. Everybody's trying to be a good boy and girl. I'm just going to be a good boy and girl, whatever that looks like, whatever that means. Everybody's just going to try and get a job. Great. Everybody's doing what they're told. Great. Everybody's, everybody accepts abuse in order to rise in the system of abuse and gives abuse to the, their inferiors, subordinate, you know, superiors and inferiors. Great. Great. Most people just muddle through. They want to be told what to do. They can be good managers, good soldiers, good members of society, people who watch Netflix. People who cheer football teams, Americans. And then here are those who are so psychopathic, like they're, they're, they excel. Class presidents elbow everybody out of the way and become fiends, become the CEOs of these murderous pharmaceutical companies, okay? Become these puppets who rule, who get to run the World Health Organization on behalf of the even tinier owners, the Rockefellers, the Schwabs, the royal families, you know, who use the World Economic Forum and all these things, who, and who can become the Hitlers and the Stalins, who can just, they're sociopaths, they've got no conscience, they don't care who they kill, and they're at the top, and they, they, they abuse everybody under them in the, in the hierarchy. So here we are talking about Americans who swallow what's on the mainstream news, swallow what they were taught in school, and like to do... So when, when someone who's knowledgeable, who's outside this, like you or I, who says, hey, you know, 9-11 was an inside job. Oh, our government factions of the CIA were actually behind the killing of our president. Many world leaders, you know, for the last 50 years at least, all around the world, all wars are created nonsense. And, um, you know, these corporations and the agenda is just to sicken and eradicate us. Have a nice day. You know, it sounds like, oh, that's conspiracy theory talk. It's like, well, forgive them. They know not, they only know what they know. Someone hasn't reach them enough. And that's why every episode and every interview is worth it because to persuade someone to think or do something that they've never seen anybody else, they don't know anybody who thinks that or watches a podcast like this or reads a book like this, they might be tempted. They can be tempted. We have to hope that we're planting seeds each time. There's a marketing meme that says, Somebody has to see or hear your marketing message seven times before they see or hear it for the first time, before they, before they even start considering, oh, go to that restaurant. You know, they have to hear it seven or eight or nine times before like it even dawns on them as an option. So you and I, Robbie, we get to be, if we choose, relentless and planting seeds because you and I could both thank our stars that somebody said something that made us consider things in a not normal way. Remember the normal is the 80%, I think it is, of the bell curve who just want to think what everybody else thinks, does what everybody else does. I think I've made my point, right? You know, I did a survey amongst 10 of my friends and I asked, do you think like, do you think Martin Luther King was killed by like the FBI? And most people would agree yeah, Martin Luther King was killed by the FBI or some type of government agency that took him out. And I said, what about JFK? A lot of them didn't care. And I go, wait, so how could you agree with that, but you can't agree with the other thing? And you kind of boil it down to what's like a, a very hard topic in today's society to really talk about or be on the opposite end of, and that is the racial thing. If you said, no, Martin Luther King was killed by a nut job, I mean, maybe you'll get people that'll stop you and maybe you get that. But if you even bring up that idea of conspiracy, the government did it, people aren't going to shut you up. People aren't going to stop you. People aren't even want to get involved in it. They just want to dust their hands and walk away. You talk about JFK, do it in the community. Watch people have different opinions really start to arise. But I haven't seen that in the MLK community. And I go, wait, so if you can choose, it's like the same thing with Castro. 
why can you say that's okay to take that guy out, but then you can't get to the other factor of maybe they took Kennedy out? You know, you get to these weird lineups on things, and you just start realizing there's really weird topics and areas where it's a double standard. You should be able to question both those aspects of things and not limit it. I mean, it's like I said, man, I mean, I I, I, will, I want to think in this area where like, you know, this idea, like, did you ever listen to the Facebook um inter, or not Facebook, the Joe Rogan interview with Zuckerberg? Not yet. Um, he mentioned it's a lot of dry stuff. He's kind of boring a little bit, but he said something that's really important about the Hunter Biden laptop thing. Now that happened in a state away from me in Delaware. I knew it was fucking true, but they deleted it and you couldn't send the link to anybody on Facebook or anything. He told Joe Rogan on air in front of everybody that the FBI came to him and told him that there's some Russian disinformation going around and you need to lower it at the bottom of your search. And then eventually, once it's completely lowered, you start banning the links from being sent. He admitted that on a podcast that the FBI came to him and told him that that would have been a conspiracy before that. But now it's now verified because he's the owner of Facebook and he's in charge of what happens with Facebook. The reason why I think he said that and he was open about the FBI doing that was because not too long ago, after that message was being spread around, Zuckerberg was in court and he was getting roasted. And pe there was a whistleblower that came out of nowhere talking about your algorithms are all manipulating people and doing all this type of stuff. And you see him there trying to defend himself, but he's also not trying to throw the FBI and everybody under the bus, like an Oswald situation, kind of. And you get into this point where, oh, you just pissed him off. You just realize you screwed him over. And now he's going to tell your secrets on a giant platform that has over like 3 million listens per episode, which is Joe Rogan. I mean like Joe Rogan or not, that is a very crucial interview that just happened with that guy. And that was some very important messaging where you start realizing that the big corporations, the big tech, everybody knows they're, in, they're working with the media. They're working with the government. It's all influence because the main Google, all these things, do you really think when they say they're going to ban search results because they care about the safety of you and your child, do you think they really care compared to the billions of dollars they're probably getting? No, they don't. They're just doing what's being told. It's not their fault. I mean, if I was a business and I was so disconnected from the world, would I do the same thing? And you just realize it's not necessarily about caring about people anymore. It's about making your own life better and keeping your life better and doing as you're told. And then now you're in the mindset of the big tech people. Well, how do we get that personal experience back? How do we create the world to a point where it's more personal? It's not so much business. You got people that don't care. You got people that are outside on the bell curve that are committing suicide or hating life. Most of them are the creatives, the writers, the authors, the comedians, the actors, the every single person that's trying to do something that's not a normal nine to five job. It shouldn't be like that. It should be how it was told in the beginning. It's not strange that all my Bulgarian and uh, Romanian friends that come over here every single summer to my town talk about, I don't really like America that much. It's not really what they say. It's like, well, you got to make it work for you. And that's a difficult thing to tell someone when they're promised the land of the free. And I'm not sitting here saying you got to tear up the government or anything, but you should definitely question more. You should have more conversations, much like me and you are doing right now. Absolutely. And yeah, because then you would find the disparity and, you know, people you would, could challenge ourselves and others. All, all right. What, you, what? It's all rigged. That's a, that's a fair conclusion, you know, and, and at the same time, we're here. We, we want to live in the, the long natural life that's given to us with with health and happiness. And that's a huge challenge, you know. Uh, my focus more and more is, is, is about how am I doing moment by moment with my own mind and emotions and putting that on the table as that's the most important thing, because when we're scared, we're dumber. That's act that's proven by many, many studies. And it's also by human experience. Like you get scared, uh, you don't think of everything that you could or should that's possible because we're scared. And you look at the effort to keep us scared. It's to keep us dumb. And the salvation is, what do you feel and why? How would you like to feel? And I recommend this as a, as a true solution. It's to everyone, in my opinion, should, the guts it takes to say, you should do this. But I'm saying it anyway. People would we, we get a lot of people get a lot out of this book called The Artist's Way. Uh, 
a spiritual way to unleash your creativity by Julia, I believe, Cameron, C-A-M-E-R-O-N. Came out about 30 years ago, big bestseller. You don't have to be an artist to want to unleash your creativity because I'm telling you, everyone, the benefits of the exercises and the, and the fun you get to do if you do the book and what you discover is by writing, by filling some pages every morning along the lines of the guidance in the book, I'm not going to do the whole teaching right here, you will probably, probably like most people who've talked about it, be delighted by what eventually comes out. It might be boring and laborious at first. It often is. But you prime the pump, and before you know it, I personally, and I know personal friends, and I've read the testimonials of the many people who bought the book and who love the book, said it opened up floodgates of, of possibilities. It opened up floodgates of things we didn't know about ourselves. By getting up an hour early in the morning, having your coffee or your tea, and forcing yourself to write by hand with a pen in a notebook, not type, not on your phone, because the ancient advice is know thyself. Who am I? What do I want? What's good? What's evil? How do you live a good life? What is a good life? The American experience of going to public school, getting a nine to five, being quote unquote normal, being a slave is designed to stop you from examining yourself as an individual or becoming an individual because the tyrants don't want a nation of individuals thinking for themselves. You can't control a nation of individuals who think for themselves. And that was the creative chaos and excitement of our first 80 years, really up until the Civil War. Read Democracy in America by de Tocqueville, classic, wrote in the 1840s. He toured the United States back at the time and wrote a big fat book about his observations about, wow, the explosion of creativity and prosperity for those who were free was, was what we were designed to be. And we lasted about 80 years because by then, the founding generation and their immediate children and grandchildren were starting to were dead or dying off, and you could slowly corrupt the what we were, what we were supposed to be. And our hope and salvation, ladies and gentlemen, and Robbie, I know you'll agree, is our rights. It's the definition of what a human being is per the American founders, someone who is endowed with certain inalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and that we can create governments that honor and protect those rights. And when a government stops doing that, it is our duty to do something about it. And if we would only somehow force our representatives at every level, local, county, state, and federal, to work for us, with honesty and transparency, it could still work. It's still an ideal, a goal to a, a, a light at the end of the black, smoky, horrible chaos that we live in to work toward, to think about, to talk about, and to challenge people to want to think for themselves. Bruce, I just got one question for you and i know we haven't even really talked about your book a whole lot and i'm sorry for that but i've enjoyed the conversation a lot um and i think it's it probably answers itself throughout this episode but were you nervous about writing your book like this i mean are you just so empowered by kind of just trying to get this information out there i mean we both obviously think on the same level i'm sure you've seen vincent salandria speak about things before in interviews and people go he's, he's a little bit out there i'm like well you're not on his level He's kind of like been into this and researched a lot more into it. And it's like the idea of trying to convince people about conspiracy is real. It's not flat earth stuff. You know, the idea of corrupted people, obviously holding their power. Nobody gives up power. It doesn't happen. And power corrupts. Absolutely. And it's about getting people to that level of understanding. They can believe it with things they come in contact with, like maybe a business, you know, 
something like that. But trying to consider the overall message, it's not just the businesses, it's the whole damn boat. It's the whole damn thing. Um, I'm curious to when you were writing a book and you were going to release talking about a lot of JFK 9-11, a lot of controversial issues that people roll their eyes at. Were you nervous at all? No. And it's because um, by the time I was in my 40s and I, I no, I was I was it was only in 2014 that I decided to uh, put these things in a book. But for 10 years. As I was researching things, I was going on stage at an open mic every Wednesday night for, for a 15 minute turn. You could do three songs or 15 minutes or they let spoken word. And I would rant and rave and teach the audience what I was learning about 9-11, about the Federal Reserve, about the Bushes, about Skull and Bones. Because I wanted to stay warmed up as an actor because for decades before that, Robbie, I was an actor. I was always on stage. So I love the open mic as a chance once a week. I could, I could get up on stage and stay comfortable um, on stage. And I, was, a, I had, was already a writer because I had written a nice manuscript about energy and consciousness and the nature of reality and all this lovey, all that lovey-dovey stuff that I love about having a spiritual imagination. And I got on, and in 2011, I got up, and for seven weeks, it was the 10 year anniversary of 9 11, I taught about 9 11. In 2013, it was the 50th anniversary of President Kennedy's assassination. For seven weeks, I got up on stage and I taught about the Kennedy assassination. And that's what did the trick for me because I could not stop researching President Kennedy, his administration, and his assassination. I became obsessed with President Kennedy, his administration, and the assassination. And one year later in 2014, I realized I, have, I will write this kind of book. And I was excited to do it because I, I felt the effect that the truth had on me. In, tw in 2005, as part of my research into things, I went to a friend's seminar on how money really works and really, really laid out how the, what the Federal Reserve is, what a scam that is. And when he was done with his presentation, I said, you mean this, that, and the other thing about this is really illegal, whatever, whatever? He said, yeah. And I said, what about this, this, that, and the other thing? He said, yeah. And I stood up in this little room. I made everybody laugh. I said, you mean there's really a dragon to slay? There's really a dragon to slay? There's really a dragon to slay. And I'm so angry at anyone who fools anybody. And Robbie, I have fun explaining it this way. When I was on stage in a play and you came to see me perform a lie, I'm going to pretend it's true. I want you to think that everything you're seeing is really happening that we hear up on the stage. But we all know it's a lie. It's an honest lie. I'm entertaining you with an honest lie. But you tell lies to cause wars that actually kill and hurt people i'm pissed and this is part of being i think a healthy human you know you see somebody hurt kick a dog or you know abuse someone or bully somebody you want to go for their throat and we need humans men more men to be men who embrace our natural instincts to protect the weak I could go, I could do this sermon for another week right here, Robbie. I'm, I've just, because I've, every morning I write and I read about this kind of stuff. I'm filled with it. I just want to love and empower myself and you and anyone I possibly can. They're there like a good mom. Everything's all right. And like a good dad, get up. We need your help. We need to solve these problems. I'm excited to read your book. You're going to talk about that. I don't know. We got, got to get it in your hands. I don't know if it's in your hands. I'm going to get it in your hands. Uh, is there a place where people can find your books? I know you have them on Amazon, but you got any other links? Um, do you have a certain publisher or anything? Yes. I want people to go to brucedetaurus.com and read all the reviews. Read what all these amazing people, a lot of your guests have said about my book. And decide for yourself if you'd like to buy it. There's an easy link right there. You can go to tryanddate.com and buy it. 
I'm going to link all your links in the description, Bruce. It's been a pleasure chatting with you. And thanks for listening to this episode of Out of the Blank.